We started test, uh, testing for MEM1 in 1997. It was set up by um, Sean Allard, who's our head of department. And we receive referrals from within the UK and, and we also get um, referrals from, from you know, countries around the world, and particularly uh, Australia and New Zealand. Um, and to date we've tested over 1,200 patients. Um, and about a third of those are, are patients who have MEM1 and also have um, a family history of MEM1. And we identified a mutation in over 300 of those patients. Um, okay, so um, the MAM1 gene, as we've heard um, earlier, is, is on chromosome um, 11. And, um, and we have two copies of the MAM1 gene, which we inherit from our, our parents. So when I started talking this and I went, I showed it to my partner and my partner said, well, I don't even know what is chromosome, what is a gene. And I thought I wasn't quite sure um, for a lot of the patients here, you know, what their knowledge of genetics was. So I thought I'd just very quickly um, go through what, what chromosomes and genes and DNA is. So, um, so the human body is made up of trillions of cells and within each cell you have a nucleus. Um, and th this, this nucleus contains chromosomes and these consist of tightly compacted DNA. So DNA really is a hereditary material in humans and, and the information in DNA is stored as a code and it's basically made up of, of four chemical bases, A, T, G and C is what we all refer to them as. And um, A only really likes to pair with T and G only likes to pair with C and that is how, how the code is, is made up. And, um, and human DNA contains about three billion bases. And um, if you were to try and type that out, um, one base per second, that would take you 95 years. So it's a long time to write it out. And, and each of us, this is something my seven-year-old finds fascinating really, is that each of us has enough DNA to reach from here to the sun and back over 300 times. So going back, so a gene then is a segment of DNA that contains the code used to synthesize a protein. And humans have about approximately 20,000 genes. So if, you know, in its essence, really, um, if you think about the, the nucleus as a library, within that library you have books, which are your chromosomes. And we take um, one book um, out of that, that pool of books and you've got one chromosome. So for instance, in this case, chromosome 11. And within that, you'll have recipes, which are the genes. Um, and then these, these recipes, if you like, then go on to encode a protein. So the MEM1 gene contains um, 10 exons and 9 introns. So the exons, if you like, are the coding part of the gene. So if I go back to our Victoria sponge uh, recipe I just showed you there before, is that um, these are essentially, the exons are essentially the, the ingredients we need to make the cake. And, um, and, and the introns are the non-coding regions, and these are, are the, the cooking utensils you need to make the cake, but they won't actually form part of the, the finished product. And the protein, um, as we've heard before, is, is, uh, is menin, so, which is a tumor suppressor, which just basically keeps the cell um, in check and stops it from growing in an uncontrolled way or dividing in an uncontrolled way. So then what, when things go wrong, what, what, what's a mutation? Well, a mutation is a change in the DNA sequence, but it's important to remember that we all get changes in our DNA, but they're not all disease-causing. Only a small <coughs> percentage uh, will actually be disease-causing, and the rest will have no effect at all. Um, but if this change isn't changed um, by the cell machinery in the cell, it will be, uh, that will be in a cell that will become an egg or sperm, then it's passed down to, to our offspring. And there are different types of mutations. Um, so you, examples really <coughs> I've, I've shown here are you can have point mutations that change a single base, or you can have deletions that might delete um, part of the, the gene or indeed the whole gene. So if we go back to uh, the cake recipe again, you can see that um, you know, the, the recipe said decorate with jam, cream and sugar, icing sugar, whereas if you had a point mutation, for instance, it might change that to ham. So it's not a very pleasant cake. And similarly, if you have a deletion, then it's rather plain cake. Um, and so that's just an idea of how it goes. So how do we currently test for mutations in the MEM1 gene in the lab? Well, um, the first thing we need to do is extract DNA from the sample that we've been sent. Then we want to look at the coding regions of the MEM1 gene that make the protein. And so we amplify those up, and I'll talk a bit about more about that in a second. And then we want to look at the sequence and, and see if we can find any changes. And also we'll look for point mutations and we'll also look for deletions. So if any of you have had a, a, an MEM1 uh, genetic test, you will have the blood sample taken and the clinician will have filled in the form. And then um, we, we, when that arrives in our lab, we put a barcode on the sample and on the form so we can match them together. And then the DNA is extracted and, and this is done using a robot. 
Um, and then the DNA that we get out at the end is stored in, in these little 2D barcoded tubes. And again, these are matched up to the sample when it first came in. And this, just, this allows sample tracking all the way through the lab. And all the information relating to that patient is stored in a password protected database in the lab. So the next thing we want to do is, is basically look at the MAM1 gene. Well, the DNA that we've extracted from the blood sample we received only contains a very small amount of the MAM1 gene. And so what we need to do is, is amplify that up to make more of it so that we can analyse it. And this is done using a process called polymerase chain reaction. And it's essentially like photocopying the bits of the gene that we want to look at. And the end result is that you have millions and millions of copies of, of that coding region, which are underlined here in red underneath the purple bits. And again, this is done uh, using a robot. So then we want to actually sequence um, the, the, the DNA that we've got. And this is the process by which you know, we read the, 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 um, the bases in the gene. And, um, and it's come a long way from um, the 1970s when we used to use radiation to read the sequence. Now we use fluorescent dyes and the, with the help of a laser. And what you get now is, is an output that looks like this. So you can see we each, each you get combination of um, you get a combination of different colours. And, and then what we do then is we will look at the sequence and we compare it to the known sequence of MAM1. And so you can see here this represents a mutation. So you can see that in addition to the, um, the G allele that's there, this patient also has a C allele there. So bear in mind that, um, remember of course, that we have two copies of the MAM1 gene. So what you're seeing there is the, is the copy where it doesn't have a mutation and, and the copy that does. Okay. So going back then to the graph I showed you earlier. So I said that we had uh, identified mutation in over 300 patients, but that left um, quite a lot of patients where we didn't identify a mutation. And some of those patients will have, will have gone on and actually had a mutation identified in another gene. So for instance, the patient who, who just had hyperparathyroidism might have had a, a mutation in one of the genes that are known to cause that. Um, and also, uh, you know, as we heard earlier about familial isolated pituitary adenoma, those patients have a mutation in the AIP gene. So they, they you know, might have gone on to find that. So what I did was I went back through all the patients that we had received and I tried to pull out those that actually um, had a clinical diagnosis, met the clinical diagnosis of MEM1 criteria. And so this is essentially two or more MEM1 associated tumours or one MEM1 tumour and a first degree relative with MEM1. And that brought me the number down to 52 cases where there was a family history of MEM1 and 244 sporadic cases. And the question then I asked was, well, could improvements in sequencing technology find the genetic cause of MEN1 in these patients? So what improvements have there been? Well, to sort of demonstrate this, I thought I'd use um, sequencing of the first human genome. So this was completed in 2003, and it cost 300 million and took 13 years. And that was done using Sanger sequencing, which is what we, as I sh I've just shown, we've been using, we use currently. And the thing is, Sanger sequencing remained the gold standard for over 20 years, but it has its limitations, and these limitations are what drove forward um, in, you know, in new technology, so-called next-generation sequencing. And so then, to give you an idea, using next-generation sequencing, you can now sequence the genome in a day, and it only costs a £1,000. So I think then as you can see that the main advantages of, of NGS over Sanger sequencing is it's faster, the costs are continuously coming down, so it's getting cheaper and cheaper, and you don't actually need as much sample as you do if you use Sanger sequencing. And so the other advantage, thing, well just to show, go back to the cost, is that, as I said, we, we currently just look at the coding regions of the MAM1 gene on a little bit either side of each of, each of the axons. And we could use Sanger sequencing um, to sequence the whole gene. But the problem with that is every time you um, add another bit, these are all separate reactions, There's currently 10 different reactions we have to do to sequence the MAM1 gene. And the more you add in, the more labour intensive it becomes and the more expensive it gets. And so, but with next generation sequencing, what you have is you design what we call bits and to capture the bits of the gene that you want to look at. And this is just one reaction. So you can have one reaction with as many bits as you want 
to, you know, to a certain extent in there. And so it's just one reaction, so the cost doesn't escalate. Um, and so that enables you then to sequence the whole gene. And then, so the next question is, well, why do we want to look at the non-coding regions? If they don't code for the protein, why do you want to look at them? Well, it's now known that mutations in the non-coding regions can cause disease. And we've actually detected this in our lab in patients who have hyperinsulinism, where they had these what we call deep intronic mutations. And what they actually do is they create... Um, either additional axons called pseudoaxons or they basically introduce another bit of the non-coding region into the coding region and then the, um, affect the, the protein. So I was absolutely thrilled to receive then um, the, the award from Amen so it meant I could actually look at this a bit closer. Um, and so what I did was then I contacted the clinicians who had referred patients to us for MEM1 testing and whom we didn't find a mutation and just outlined the project and asked for consent to be included in the study. And what I got was I got consent for 76 patients, um, 25 were familial and 51 were are sporadic, in other words those with ones with no family history. Um, and the reasons were for not giving consent was I had no reply to the letter or email. I mean, I have to stress that some, some of these patients were referred back in the 1990s, so the clinicians involved may have moved on. Um, and the other was in some instances the the patient didn't reply to the um, cl um, the patient didn't reply to the clinician, or they didn't want to be involved in the study, or sadly in some cases the patient had died. So for the patient we did get consent, then that, what, what did we do next? Well, the next step really was to take the DNA that we already had in storage, so it didn't require getting any new samples. Um, we cut it into smaller fragments, and then we used those the bits to capture the MEM1 gene. And then we just amplified and sequenced it using a next generation sequencer. And now for the, the results really of that. So th this is um, just this patient is the one of the first ones that we found actually mutation to be found. And this is a patient who was who was um, referred to us with um, he had hyperparathyroidism and a gastronoma that was diagnosed in his thirties. Um, his mother and his grandmother. So sorry to show you. So. This is, this is our patient here, and this is his mother and his grandmother, and they both had hyperparathyroidism. And what we find was this muta mutation. So it's quite difficult, but this essentially is, it shows that when it says this minus nine, that basically means it was in the non-coding region of the MEM1 gene. Um, and this, we, this is ter it was termed a, a splice site mutation. So what is that? Well, um, so we've just heard about how um, you have mRNA. So you have your DNA and what you then have is your mRNA and that's actually the bit that becomes your protein. So if I, I know I keep going back to my cake recipe, but if you go back to your cake, it's essentially you've got your ingredients, you don't need your um, cooking utensils anymore so they can go. And so what you're left with is, is the mRNA. And, um, and that's what makes the protein. And this mutation actually results in part of the non-coding region being incorporated in. So what you have here, so the purple here represents the exon, so that's the coding region. And these bits here on either side, these are the non-coding regions. And here in red, you can see that this, at this position there should be a G, but our patient has an A instead. And so what you actually get then is you get the incorporation of this part of the sequence into the coding, um, a coding region and that changes the code of the, that changes the, code of the gene so that the protein made um, isn't, isn't how it should be and, and it's too small and it gets degraded. So what we did, we were able to um, report this to the clinician and, and, the, and offer uh, pre-symptomatic testing to family members. The next thing we found was a previously um, reported variant in a patient who had an insulinoma and a prolactinoma um, and this patient had no fa known family history of MEM1. And, and this variant is at minus 22, and this is the non-coding part of the gene, so the, and it's known as the 5' prime untranslated region. And, and this, this variant was actually published in 2006 by a group who found it in a Danish patient who had parathyroid adenoma but no family history. But the significance of this variant was not determined by the research group. So the advantage of next generation sequencing it, uh, is that it has allowed lots of large scale sequencing projects to take place in different populations. And these projects have then led to um, the generation of databases of what we would call normal variation, if you like. So these are variants that are not disease causing, um, but are just quite common in, in population. And so 
what these these databases are absolute joy to us in the diagnostic world because we really rel we need these to be able to help us determine whether um, so a variant, a change we find in a patient is actually the cause of their disease. And when you actually look at the databases in this instance, the frequency in the population suggests that this isn't actually disease causing, but further work would need to be done. So the next um, mutation I'd like to, sh to talk to you about is this one, which we again, you can see these are all non codies This is um, minus three now. So we identified it in, in this patient here. Um, and essentially, this was reported in the literature previously as, as not being disease causing, because it was found in a DNA sample from a patient who was used to control. But one of the tools that we actually have now in the diagnostic lab is, is in silico tools that have been developed by research groups and what they can do is they look at the sequence and they can predict whether it's likely to have an effect um, just by looking at the sequence. And what this showed um, was that this likely to again incorporate part of the non-coding um, region into, into the coding region of the gene. And what we've done is, we, uh, coincidentally, we actually also subsequently find that this patient, this patient here came through our normal testing um, pipeline and we actually also identified that variant in this patient and we got back to the relevant um, clinicians and they're not, the two families are not known to be related so we have two separate families who, who have this variant and what we've done is we've um, got a blood sample from the, the patient and we're doing some further work to determine um, what the effect of that um, mutation is. So what we're left with really um, is that we have 73 patients who still um, haven't got um, the co genetic cause identified. So what, what, what is the cause of MAM1 in these patients? Well, it could be they have a mutation in another gene not yet known to be involved in MAM1. And the strategy that you could use in that instance is exome sequencing. So this is where you sequence all of the coding regions of all of the genes in the genome. Or it could be that they have a mutation in the non-coding region of the genome not yet known to be involved in MEM1. And the strategy you'd use then is, is whole genome sequencing, which is essentially analysing the entire genome. And this is actually the approach that's being used um, by the 100,000 Genomes Project. So some of you might be aware of this. It, it received uh, quite a lot of media coverage. And when David Cameron announced in 2012 that the government would be investing 100 million in sequencing the, the genomes from patients with cancer and um, rare diseases. And 11 genomic medicine centres were chosen to recruit patients. Um, we're one of the centres and, and we've just gone live and there are other centres sort of spread throughout England, I should say. Um, so yeah, so in, in summary really, um, next generation sequencing technology makes it possible to analyse all regions of the MAM1 gene in a single test. What we have shown is that our current strategy was, was pretty effective at identifying mutations. Um, but really just sequen doing the, this project has shown that has identified mutations that weren't picked up by our, our previous methodology. And I think this is an important point really that you know, patients who were tested, some of the patients that we, we one of the patients we picked up a, a mutation in was referred back to us in like in the late 1990s and they have gone all this time without a diagnosis and now, you know, in 2015 they now have a diagnosis, a genetic diagnosis. Um, and so it's important that they sometimes to go back and re-look at these patients again when technology and when our knowledge improves. And also, what we also have shown is that um, analysis of our cases that we've done shown that there's another cause. These patients, are, there, there's something somewhere else um, that is causing their MEM1. And hopefully the 100,000 genomes project, or smaller, even smaller exome sequencing, or smaller genome pro whole genome sequencing projects, will help identify new genetic causes of MEM1. So um, I'd just like to acknowledge um, uh, for my colleagues who've been really helpful in, in this project, um, both in the design of the actual assay and, and, uh, and basically help with interpreting the data that comes off um, the sequencer. And, and really, but my biggest thanks goes to the patients and clinicians for agreeing to take part in the study and, and amend for funding it. Thank you.